cleansing of our hearts. We pray that the Holy Spirit would descend and that you would lift us up to Jesus. We pray that his power and his prophecy and his promises would be made effectual in our lives today. God, direct us in the way of everlasting life, we pray. Use this time now. We ask again that all things would be underneath the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's do a little recap from where we left off last week. We've been looking at Genesis 3.15, and we found that there are three characters in the prophecy. There's God, there is the serpent, and there is this woman. And it's God, it's Jesus. He's the mediator between God and man. He's speaking to Adam and Eve, God's grace and his power over Satan here in the beginning after their sin. And so this is what God says in Genesis 3.15. He says, I will put enmity, this is tension, this variance, and put this barrier he says, I'm going to put it between you, speaking to the serpent. This is a judgment on the serpent. I'm going to put it between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And we notice that the enmity or the tension was not just between the serpent and the woman. It was also between the serpent and the woman's seed. And also it was not just between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed but also between the serpent's seed and the woman. So there's tension, there's variance uh, all the way through, but there was more than God intended that there should be because all God, although God intended there to be a barrier, a break between Adam and Eve and Satan's dominion over them, he did not intend or desire that Satan would ruthlessly attack God's people over and over again. And you and I have felt that at different times, have we not? Yes, we all have. Okay, so there was this enmity, this tension between one side and the other. Today we're going to look at this from the perspective of Revelation. Last time we went through Revelation 12. We saw that there's this woman that's described being clothed with light. There is this seven-headed dragon, which we also found as a seven-headed serpent, then we saw that the woman's seed is specifically Jesus, the seed, that he would bruise Satan's head and Satan would bruise his heel. We also found that the woman's seed not only is Jesus, but all those who believe in Jesus are accounted the seed because they are now inheritors with Christ with what he has accomplished. But we left one part un, undefined, at least from the book of Revelation, and that's what we're going to focus on today, the serpent's seed. If you recall, seed is one of the Bible's terms for referring to children. If you have kids or you know somebody's kids, kids always have something in common with their parents. There's something about the way they look. It may even, maybe not facial features, it could be body build, it could be the way they walk. There's something physical that they, how they resemble in some way their parents, but it's not just that. There's something to do with their traits, their qualities, their inner character uh, that, that expresses itself in their behaviors. And so we can see them doing things, and we're like, man, that's just, you're just like your dad, or you're just like your mom. Okay, so these are things that we see in our own kids or in other people's children. So if we are defining the serpent's seed, that means it is the serpent's child, meaning it is the devil's child, then at least as we look at it from the, the symbolism in the book of Revelation, whatever Revelation portrays about the dragon, the serpent, right? We're going to see something in appearance in the serpent's seed. Does that make sense? Okay, and then whatever we see in the type of behavior that the dragon produces, then we're going we're gonna, to uh, think through it, then it's likely that the child, the seed, is going to have similar behaviors. Is that fair? Because that's the way children work. Okay, so we're going to go to Revelation now, and I'm going to invite you to turn to Revelation chapter 12, and we're going to go through, and we're going to compare the dragon and the beast. The dragon and the beast, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12 goes now into chapter 13. If you remember, in the original Bible, there were no chapter divisions. There were no verses. Those were added many years later to help it 
uh, to help us as we study our Bible to find things easier. So, as we read Revelation 12, we know that although it ends with verse 17, the story continues on into chapter 13. So, in Revelation 12, we're going to go from 12 to 13. We're going to go back and forth a few times. And we're going to compare the dragon and the beast. Revelation 12, verse 3. Revelation 12, 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, dragon having what? Seven heads and ten horns. Here is the symbolic description of what this dragon, also called the serpent, looks like. Okay, now we're going to go to chapter 13, and we're going to go to verse 1. Revelation 13, verse 1. John says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having what? Help me. Seven heads and ten horns. Does it have something physically similar to the dragon? Amen. It sure does. Now we're going to go to verse 2. Revelation 13, 2. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him what? His power, his throne, and what else? And great authority. You help me. Do parents give their kids money? Do they, they may buy them a car or help them. They may at some point uh, leave an inheritance of a house or something to do with a will. Uh, they help them out in many different ways. They give to their kids something. Is that the truth? That is the truth. Here we see that the dragon is giving to the beast power, a throne, and great authority. We're trying to find out if this beast that is brought about in the very next chapter, which is all linked together with chapter 12, is this the serpent seed? This is what took place in Luke 4. Remember, the devil is tempting Jesus. Beginning in verse 5, this is what happens. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you. Did, he, did the devil, the dragon, give something to the beast? Did he give him, was part of it authority? Isn't that what it said? All this authority I will give you and their glory. What does he say? For this has been delivered to me, half truth, right? He stole it from Adam at the beginning, but this world has always and will always belong to who? God. To God, yes. Half truth. For this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship me, all will be yours. When the devil gives this power and this throne and this great authority to the beast, what then must the beast have done to get it? What would Jesus have had to do to get it? Have to worship him. And so if we keep reading in Revelation 13, the beast causes all the world to worship who? The dragon, because the beast itself has first worshipped the dragon. When I first got married... I was falling asleep shortly after we got married. You know, you're in that zone between being awake and being asleep. You're about to fall asleep, and I heard a voice, and it said, Deny Christ, and I'll give you everything you want. The devil is still after people to get them to worship him, to follow him, and he'll give them whatever they want. But it will come at the cost of your life. Not now, because now you're going to live it up for a while. But eventually, the time will come when you have to pay the piper, as they say. So in Revelation 12 and 13, we see that the dragon gives to the beast its power, its throne, and great authority. Now we're back in Revelation 12, and we're going to read verse 13. Revelation 12, verse 13. We're looking now at some behaviors of the dragon. Revelation 12, verse 13. When the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, what did he do? He persecuted the woman, meaning, meaning the church, right? He persecuted the woman, the church, who gave birth to the male child. Now jump to verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, the church, and he went to make what? War with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Here is a behavior, one of them, of 
the dragon. It fights God's people. If the beast is the serpent's seed, it, the child of the serpent, will we find that it would do something similar? Amen. Yes. So now we're going to go to Revelation 13 and verse 7. Speaking of the beast's power, Revelation 13, verse 7. It was granted to him to make what? War with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Now, this is just a few points from Revelation 12 and 13. We can find many throughout the scriptures. We can go in the Old Testament. We can go in the New Testament. We can find many other similarities between the dragon and the beast. And the beast is referred to in other places in the book of Revelation as well as other places in the Bible. However, this is enough just from these two chapters which we're studying today to see that the dragon and the beast, they have similar appearance. And the dragon and the beast have similar behaviors. Not only that, the dragon has given to the beast as a type of inheritance, as a gift, as the father would give to his son, power, the throne, and great authority. As we read through Revelation 12, as we did last week, it's pretty clear that the dragon is fighting the woman and that Revelation 12 is a further explanation of the first prophecy Jesus gives in Genesis 3.15. We went through that and we saw that. And Revelation 13 le uh, picks up where Revelation 12 left off. And originally, there were no chapter divisions. Who is the serpent's seed that is fully explained or more fully explained in Revelation? It is the beast. This is the serpent's seed as we use the language of Genesis 3.15. There are many individuals that would fit the serpent's seed. We could look at 1 John chapter 3, and as that book in 2 John talks about antichrists, plural, antichrist, singular, and the spirit of antichrist, it names one of the antichrists, and it names it in 1 John 3, it's Cain. It says he was of the wicked one. He was the first one against Christ. Put him, his ideas and his ways in the place of Christ. As we read through his genealogy, we find the great climax. The great climax before the flood. If you wanted to see the perfect example of an antichrist, it was Lamech. And we go through and we can find more in the Old Testament. Nimrod was another. And we can go through and find many. In the New Testament, we find people like uh, Jesus called the scribes and the Pharisees brood of vipers. He called them serpents. What was he referring to? Them being children of the devil. He says it very clearly in John chapter 8, verse 44. You are of your father, the devil, he said. Serpent seed. We could call Judas the serpent seed. We could call Caiaphas the serpent seed. In fact, there's many people that we could refer to as the serpent seed. But as we look at it from the book of Revelation... And as we see Revelation 12 and 13 unpacking Genesis 3.15, uh, Revelation says that the serpent's seed is the beast. Let's notice a few interesting things about the dragon and the beast. The dragon, John in Revelation 12, sees it up in heaven, meaning in the sky. When he talks about the beast in Revelation 13, it com comes up out of the sea or the water. If we keep reading Revelation 13, there's another, it's a second beast, a lamb-like beast that comes up out of the earth or out of the land. In other words, when the devil chooses to attack God's people, he's going to do it by air, he's going to do it by water, and he's going to do it by land. And he doesn't care which way he gets you, he's going to find a way to attack you. Is that true? Yeah. But no matter which way he attacks us, God has a way to overcome God has a way to cause us to persevere. Isn't that right, Ann? He gives us that perseverance, that endurance. In fact, the Bible says he pronounces a blessing on those who endure to the end, as Jesus says in Matthew 24. In the book of Revelation, there's a lot of contrast. There are two churches. There's the temple of God. There's the synagogue of Satan. There's two women. There is the woman in Revelation 12 clothed with light. There is also this woman in Revelation 17 called, called the Scarlet Harlot. Uh, there's two cities. There's the New Jerusalem and there's Babylon. There's two types of angels. There's God's angels and there's the devil's angels. And there's other contrasts. I'd like to focus in on one today 
that helps us understand the beast being the serpent's seed. That is, that the book of Revelation presents two trinities, one genuine and the other one counterfeit. Here are the two trinities. We have God the Father, we have Jesus, the Son of God, and we have the Holy Spirit, what we often refer to as the Godhead. But the book of Revelation prevent, uh, presents a counterfeit trinity. It's called the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The devil is the god of this world. That's what the Bible calls him. The beast is the son of the god of this world. And the false prophet has the spirit of the dragon in it. And this is the counterfeit trinity that is presented in the book of Revelation. And it further helps us understand that the beast is the serpent's seed. So who is this beast in Revelation 13? Let's line this up because this is not the first time we hear about the beast. And if you've studied Bible prophecy, uh, you know we're going to go to the book of Daniel. We're going to go to the book of Daniel. I'm going to invite you to turn, turn with me in your Bible to Daniel chapter 7, verse 3. Keep your finger in Revelation, a bookmark, a pencil, something in there. Because we're going to go from Daniel and then pretty soon we're going to go back to Revelation. Daniel chapter 7, beginning in verse 3. Daniel chapter 7, that's in the Old Testament. It's almost towards the end of the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 7. We find a reference to this beast power. Revelation 7 verse 3. Uh, Daniel 7, verse 3. Daniel chapter 7, verse 3. And four great beasts came up from where? From the sea, okay? So we're going to put down some things to help us compare this to the beast in Revelation. Came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a what? Like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly, another beast, a second, like a what? Like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another, like a, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast. So we're going to put the word beast up here, because if you read Daniel, he doesn't know what to compare this beast to. The other ones, okay, it's a lion, it's a bear, it's a leopard. He looks at this animal, he's like, I don't know what it is. He doesn't find anything in the animal kingdom to compare it to, so he just calls it a beast. And Revelation calls it the beast. Verse 7, after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, it had huge what? Iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. It had what? Ten horns. Okay. Now we're going to summarize briefly Daniel chapter 2 because we know that Daniel 7, if you've studied the book of Daniel, is an ex a further explanation of Daniel 2. In Daniel chapter 2, God gives a pagan king. And God loves pagan kings, right? He loves everybody. He gives a pagan king this dream. And he sets everything up for this pagan king who worshipped devils and sacrificed to devils and was the head of Babylon. He set everything up to minister God's grace to this pagan king. And God still is in charge of ministering his grace to the modern king of Babylon. Is that true? Amen. Yes, it is. So we got to pray for everybody. Amen. Now, in Daniel chapter 2, it doesn't talk to us about any sea, but there's a statue and there's this golden head. There is this uh, silver chest and arms. Then there are bronze belly and thighs. And finally, there's iron legs. However, afterwards, it says that uh, the feet and the toes are made of iron and clay. And so this lines up with Daniel chapter 7, and it's the same thing. In fact, in Daniel 2, uh, Daniel interprets the dream, and he tells Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. And he was the head of this kingdom of Babylon. But the sea in Daniel 7, as well as in Revelation 13, represents this world, especially the world they lived in, uh, that, that, uh, the then-known world of the time. But all the world, these four main kingdoms in that area, 
Then the head of gold is Babylon, the silver chest and arms, that's the following kingdom, Medo-Persia, and that's made clear if we were to study Daniel chapter 8, which we're not doing this morning. The bronze belly and thighs, that is the kingdom of Greece, Daniel chapter 8 also clarifies that. It doesn't tell us exactly what is the fourth kingdom, but as we study history, secular history, it tells us that after Greece, what was the kingdom that came, if you studied it, that in school? It was Rome. Okay, so here's the next part, Rome, and then eventually Rome was not taken over by another world kingdom, but it was divided. So here we have these three columns that we're going to compare real quick. Babylon, the head of gold, the lion. Medo-Persia, the silver chest and arms, the bear. Greece, bronze belly and thighs, the leopard. And then we come to Rome, has iron legs in Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel 7, this beast has iron teeth. We're looking at some parallels. Then Rome is divided, and it says that in Daniel 2 that there's this iron and clay. It's divided. It's mixed. It's partly strong, uh, partly not so strong. There's feet and there's toes. How many toes does the average person have? Ten. Okay, ten toes. And now we look at this beast. How many horns does it have? It has ten. And as we study the book of Daniel, we see that it's all lining up, and it's going to help us further identify this beast in Revelation chapter 13. So now we're going back to Revelation 13, verse 1. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. Revelation 13, verse 1. I'm reading from the New King James. You may have another version. I want to point something out here in a minute. Revelation 13, verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea. How many of you have a version that says that he stood on the sand of the sea or the dragon stood on the sand of the sea? You have that? Okay, anybody else? Okay, let's talk about that for just a second. Sometimes we notice these strange differences in translations. It, sometimes it's just an option to choose from, but in this case, uh, you're going to see, I'm going to put up the, the uh, verb in Greek. Here it is. It's this word for stood. Up at the top, we have the King James and the New King James, and that's how it looks in the Greek. It's in the first person singular. That means I, if you like English. Maybe you failed English and you didn't like English. First person singular is I. Now, here is the, the NIV and the New American Standard. Do you see how it looks in the Greek? It's almost exactly the same except for what? Except for one letter, and that now makes it in the third person. So if you are translating that and you're using the manuscript that has left off the letter, you're going to translate it as he or as the dragon because that's the context. Now, in this situation, maybe a scribe, somebody was reading to him the scriptures and he was writing it and he missed it, or maybe he was writing it and copying it and he missed the letter. Is it possible? It's possible. Sometimes they, they have these little, uh, small little discrepancies in the manuscripts, and other times they're a little bit bigger. But whenever you find the difference between the translation that you're using and another one you hear somebody reading, you should do a little bit of investigation, and you may find that it may, may be something simple like this. However, this is not going to change the meaning of the prophecy. So we're going to keep reading. We're in chapter 13 and verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a what? A beast, okay? Now we're lining this up with what we learned from Daniel. I saw a beast. Did Daniel see a beast? Yes, he saw it in Daniel 7. I saw a beast rising up out of what? The sea. Did Daniel see four beasts rising up out of the sea, including the fourth beast that he didn't know what to compare it to? Yes. I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and how many horns? Ten horns. Does the beast in Daniel 7 have also ten horns? Yes. Ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Verse 2. Now the beast which I saw was like what? Okay, now watch what's going to happen. In Daniel 7, it lists the lion, then the bear, the leopard, and then the beast. In Revelation 13, it lists it, but it lists it backwards. Okay, the beast says, says the, now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. And his mouth like the mouth of a Lion. Okay, let's pause there. Do you see how that all lines up? In Daniel 7, God is giving Daniel the vision of how the kingdoms of the earth would unfold from his day in, uh, in, in that empire. Because it's going to go Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. But now in John's day, they're not in Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. They're now in Rome. And he's giving John a vision of how it looks going backwards. But not only that, Rome, the, that he's in, this beast is the 
progression from Babylon. They handed things down to Medo-Persia, then Greece inherited, and then Rome inherited many things from Greece. Is that true? And it's a, it's a big mix of it all. So here is this beast. It is similar, uh, has many similar characteristics to what we see in Daniel. In fact, when we line it up and we study it even further, we see it's the same power. Now we're going to go to Revelation chapter 17. The beast is clearly, as we compare it here, it's Rome. Does that make sense? Okay, it's Rome. The empire of Rome. Now we're going to go to Revelation 17. Because in Revelation, the beast is also referred to by a code name, Babylon. It's the word Babylon. So in Revelation 17, we're going to try to cut to the chase here for the sake of time and go to verse 5. Revelation 17, verse 5. There's this woman, and she's riding this scarlet-colored beast. Revelation 17, 5. And on her forehead, a name was written. Mystery. What does it say in your Bible? Babylon, right? Okay. Babylon the Great. Now, we know Babylon doesn't exist at this time anymore. Mystery. Babylon the Great. And, you know, um, um, Saddam Hussein, he wanted to rebuild uh, Babylon. That was his dream. He wanted his, his... His hero was Nebuchadnezzar, the one who founded the Neo-Babylonian Empire that we read about in the book of Daniel. That was Saddam Hussein's hero. He wanted to rebuild Babylon, but he wasn't able to. And you can go and you can even uh, map it on Google, and you can go and you can see Babylon, how it looks today. It's, you know, deserted. They're trying to build some stuff there, but it was never rebuilt. So when we talk about Bible prophecy and we look at Babylon, whether it is... uh, what it meant back then or what it means further today, there is no literal place called Babylon that, that has the ingredients of what the Bible talks about. Babylon was destroyed a long time ago. So on her forehead, there's this name, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Does the beast and the dragon fight against God's people? Yes. Okay, that's why this woman is described that way. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. In Revelation 13, does all the world marvel or wonder after the beast? Yes. Verse 7. But the angel said to me, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast which carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Seven heads. Seven mountains. Is Rome a city built on seven hills? Yeah, okay. Jump down to verse 18. Cutting to the chase. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. In John's day, what was the great city that ruled all the then known world? Which, what, which city? It was Rome. City on seven hills. Notice what it says here in 1 Peter 5, verse 13. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. What does Peter mean, she who is in Babylon? Because Babylon didn't exist. It had been destroyed. It is is code language that they understood, and it referred to Rome. And Peter is writing this uh, this letter from the church. He's sending greetings. The church in Rome is sending greetings Uh, And that's what he's describing here in his letter. And this is what Nelson's New Illustrated Bible Dictionary says in page 149. When the book of Revelation was written, Babylon may have been a kind of code name for pre-Christian Rome, which was built on seven hills, and which was already persecuting the church. In 1 Peter 5.13, Babylon probably refers to the city of Rome. Let's do a quick recap of what we've studied. We began this series looking at Genesis 3.15 and understanding that it was referring to something not literal about a woman being afraid of a snake, 
uh, but it was something spiritual and symbolic. We realize that since the beginning, there's been tension between the devil and God's people. And not only did God put this, this divide between them in terms of the ceremonial law that we studied in the first, uh, the first sermon that we, that we talked about. Not only did he do that, but we saw last time that in Revelation 12, that it's much bigger than that. And today we're seeing that this, the ramifications of this prophecy that Jesus gave in Genesis 3.15, even though it was so short and abbreviated in Genesis, we see it's much larger in the book of Revelation. Then we noticed that there is something interesting between the dragon and the beast. They look similar and they behave similar and the dragon gives type of an inheritance to the beast. And as we're looking at all these things together, it's validating the fact that the, the serpent's seed in Revelation is identified as the beast or as Rome. Then we looked at these two trinities, the genuine, the father, son, Holy Spirit, the counterfeit, the dragon, the God of this world, the beast, who is the son of the God of this world, and the false prophet who has a false spirit. And that further helps us to understand the beast as the son or the seed of the serpent. Then we go through and we compare what we see in Daniel, and there's a lot more, but we're abbreviating, and we see that this beast in Revelation 13 lines up with Daniel. It's the power of Rome. And so we go back and we identify the serpent seed from Revelation as this seven-headed beast in Bible prophecy. Did Rome persecute God's people? Yes. In the early Christian church, the Roman emperors were persecuting the Christians. They were hanging them up, burning them at the stake. They were throwing them to the lions. They were having, making sport of them. I believe it was Nero that would hang them up on, uh, on stakes and light them on fire to illuminate uh, his drunken parties. They were persecuting the church. But do you know that before Rome persecuted the church, that the church persecuted the church? You know, that's still the biggest problem. It's not the people out there that persecute us. It's the people within the church that we sometimes have the most problems with. Who was it that wanted Jesus crucified? Was it Pilate in Rome that wanted Jesus crucified? Yeah, it was the Jewish leaders that wanted Jesus crucified. And they found a way to finagle it and to put pressure so that the Roman government would crucify Jesus. If we read in the beginning chapters of the book of Acts, after Stephen gives his testimony, they stone him. Who stoned him? The Sanhedrin, the church. After that, this great persecution by the Jewish, Jewish church was waged against this sect, this denomination that was also part of the Jewish church, which were called followers of the way, who later became called Christians. The church persecuted those people that didn't see things exactly the way they saw them. Now, you can read through the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you can see that there were certain laws that they lived by, and they said, if somebody does this, this should be the punishment or the judgment. But I have not found, maybe you have, I, I don't recall seeing any place in the Bible that says, if a person doesn't interpret this Bible passage the same way as you do, that you can kill them and persecute them. I don't recall reading that. And so this is what happens in, this is what happened in the early church. They persecuted Christ because he didn't teach and do things the way they thought. Then they persecuted the apostles because they taught that Jesus was the son of God and that they had murdered him. And so then Rome also persecuted the church. But then as Rome continued and also uh, later uh, as it became a, also a religious power, it continued as a church to persecute those who were part of the church. Should we ever persecute people that don't agree or interpret a Bible passage the way we do? No, no we should not. No. There are people in our church and in other churches that may interpret something a little bit different than we do. We should never hate on them. We should never gossip about them. We should never despise them, think less of them, uh, think that somehow they are the spawn of Satan. Maybe they're just mistaken. I imagine when we get to heaven, each one of us on something is going to find out that we too are mistaken. Yeah, we're wrong on something. 
we are going to have enmity with the devil. That's just the way it is. The, devil, uh, the enmity that God instituted in the beginning is not the type of enmity that the devil is bringing against us. But God knew that he would do that. Are you having problems at work because you want to live by what the Bible says? Are you having problems in your marriage or in your relationships because the Bible says something and you want to put it into practice? Are you having problems with your friends? Maybe you're having a hard time meeting somebody. Uh, maybe you're looking for somebody special and you're having a hard time because you want to follow the Bible in. You're, not, you're having a hard time finding somebody who also wants to follow the Bible. Amen. Maybe at work you have to make a decision that is in line with the Bible, but it's not in line with what else is going on. How do you, how do you handle that? Have you ever been attacked? Have you ever been rejected? Have you lost sleep, time, money, energy? Because you're trying to live out your life the right way according to the Bible and somebody else or some situation presents itself and the devil uses that to attack you. Christ has overcome Satan. And he gives us this same ability, even if it leads us to death, whether that's physical death or the death of something in our life. The Bible never said it would be easy, but the Bible says it will be 100% worth it. Amen. You keep going in the direction that God has led you in. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't think that you're going to fudge things and just kind of try to push that Bible verse to the side. You make a decision to follow God. We're going to pray for each other and keep each other accountable. Before Jesus comes, it's not going to get better, right? It's going to get worse. Amen. So let's make a decision, even though it's going to cost us now. Remember that there is a reward laid up for us in heaven. Amen? Amen. Let's take a moment of silence and reflect on our life and what this means for us.